Grab your Bibles, fire up your devices. We're in Acts chapter 15 as we continue in this series, Groundswell, a study of the church. And what we're looking for are these characteristics, these characteristics of the, the early church. Then we want to hold them up to Fellowship Church and see, are we a, a New Testament biblical church? And then as we do that, well, we also want to hold it up to our lives and make sure our lives then are, are living out, well, the, the truth of Scripture. Because we do believe from beginning to end, the Bible teaches that obedience brings blessing. Obedience brings reward. And so, uh, if you'll grab your Bibles, we're going to Acts chapter 15. I want to welcome those online. Thank you for logging in and worshiping with us. Our online folks are standing by. If you need some help or questions, comments, uh, you can pick up that phone and call the number on the bottom of the screen as well. I want to also give a shout out to the simulcast service, man. Thank you guys. Uh, but let's jump into this thing. Uh, and so there were really four major biblical characteristics that I believe have taken the New Testament early church and used it to blow up into what is this global movement, this groundswell, you could say, that has spanned the ages now over 2,000 years and all around the globe. And really those, those four things, we've said them for, since the very beginning, these four major beliefs were one, they had a bedrock convictional belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They believe that God came in the flesh, he died on the cross, and he rose from the dead. And that is what propelled them. Uh, remember, uh, Paul was, was preaching, and they said, hey, you better quit preaching that. And he said, I can't, can't not preach what I've seen and I've heard. Peter says, I, I don't really understand what you're saying, but I, I've got to go with the guy that came out of the grave. And so we've got to be people that no matter what, we have this convictional belief that Jesus Christ and Christ crucified. He died and he rose from the dead. This is what was the, the, the thing that unified this most diverse movement on planet earth, which is called the church. Second is they had this unwavering commitment to the sanctity of human life. They had this unwavering commitment to realize that every human being has cre been created on purpose and for great purpose in the image of God, and they have value. And what we see in the early church is in that, that Roman world particularly that was such uh, man, just a, a mess of, of sexual ethic, they would have babies and toss them out onto the trash heaps. And early in the morning, the cool dew of the early morning, Christians would get out and they would go through the cities and they would pick up those babies off the trash heaps and they would raise them as their own because they believed in the foundational element that everybody has created the image of God. And so this is why we too hold to such a, a strong view of the sanctity of human life, whether it be an unborn baby uh, all the way to the grave. This is why we support not just crisis pregnancy centers, but it's why we support ministries to uh, young moms with young children to make sure they have the training, the food, the diapers, the care, a home that they need. It's why we take care of those that are human trafficked. This is why we take care of those all the way to the end of life uh, through our, our, our homes and healthcare ministries. It's why we take care of, uh, we have a home just here in our city for those with, with special needs because my friends, we believe in the sanctity of human life. And the Bible preaches this from cover to cover. And this is something we will champion always. And so you'll notice in your bulletins, there is a handout here. And there is a, a movement uh, across the U.S. to rewrite state constitutions to ensconce, well, legal abortions uh, in the state. And we have this happening in our state. I spoke about this not many weeks ago, uh, but now we are seeing them. They're going door to door in our neighborhoods. How many of you have had someone come door to door? You've heard about them door to door. You've seen them at, at stores of uh, this whole, uh, trying to, the petition initiative. Anyone seen those folks? So lots of, lots of folks have. So we have uh, out of state funders, about $5 million the last I heard, uh, coming into fund. These pe people are making anywhere from 20 to $40 an hour to collect signatures. If they can get enough signatures by the date, which is coming here quickly, and they will, by the way, they will, they're buying them, they're essentially buying them, they'll get them, then you can, in the state of Missouri, put what is called a voter initiative petition on the ballot. And so the voter initiative petition then is a change to our constitution that if they get 50% plus one, uh, and they got to carry the precincts in that, way, in that same way, then they could rewrite our entire constitution. And then what they're going to do is essentially make uh, where currently Missouri is a life state, uh, it would be, well, a death state. There are really no rules. We were just at a luncheon with uh, 
an individual, actually it's our, our Secretary of State, and he said uh, there are no rules to abortion. Uh, that, you know, there's just, it's, all things go in the state of Missouri. And then you really can't go back and legislate against the, the, the Constitution. Once it's there, it's there. And uh, they've already won this in, uh, I want to say, 13 states at last count. So we've got to be on guard. So check this out. Make sure that you and your friends know about this. And so that you, one, you don't sign, but two, that your friends know about it. Because the, the wording that they're trying to get you to sign on is about health care. And, uh, well, everybody's for health care, amen? Uh, everybody's for, for women's rights. Uh, but what this means is, is death. And so uh, here are some things, some resources on the back. We'll be posting this to our social media. Share it like crazy. Let's make sure everybody knows that that is not something we want to sign. If it does, does go through, and more than likely it will, it will go on the ballot in probably August or November, and then uh, that'll be the real fight for Christians. Are we going to stand for life? Uh, because uh, if we've got to. That was one of the core elements of the early church. And it's got to be a core element of who we are. Uh, thirdly, they lived out a biblical sexual ethic. They believed what Jesus said is that God created male and female. Did you know that the first sentence about humanity in the Bible is God made them male and female? Isn't it interesting? The very first sentence about the crown jewel of his creation, you and I, is he says there's two genders. And so there's two genders, male and female, and then they were created in a covenant marriage of a, of a, of a husband and a wife, and that is biblical, uh, a biblical sexual ethic. Anything outside of covenant marriage of a man and a woman is, well, it, it leads to harm and destruction and hurt and decay, as we all, we all understand, but they, they live by this in a world that really makes our culture look fairly tame in the first century Rome. And then, uh, fourthly, they had this other characteristic that work is ministry. They saw their workplace, the place they spent the bulk of their time, as their primary ministry. So you and I, we are ministers. We are missionaries to our workplaces. This is something we got to rediscover. Uh, I, I've been probably beating the dead horse here because I've been saying it about every Sunday, but we have in the American West culture, church, we have divorced really ministry we got secular and we have sacred things. Well, I go to work and do secular things, then I come to church and do uh, sacred things. Well, no, everything for the Christian is, is sacred. The workplace is a sacred mission. The, the neighborhood is a sacred mission. The school is a sacred mission. And we've got to rediscover that. That is our primary ministry. That is what we do. And so as we look at these four things, and then there are some other characteristics we're going to pull, we've been pulling out. Again, today we're going to look at another one and then hold them up to our church and go, okay, do we operate this way? And then as believers, do we live this way? So here's the thing. Anytime you put more than one person in a room together, contention happens. Amen? Anybody ever been married? You can say amen. Uh, contention happens even in the church. And now there might be some out there that would say especially in the church. Contention happens especially in these four walls. And, you know, there are some people who like to romanticize the early church. If we could just get back to being like the early church, it'd all be wonderful. Oh, my friends, you, you haven't read the book of Acts. Uh, the, the early church, there are many things we need to learn from them, but they had the same issues that we have. They were, in many ways, just as dysfunctional and problematic as, as any local assembly on planet Earth today. I mean, some of these were hotbed for controversy in their time. Uh, and so the question is not whether the church is going to have contention. The question then is how do we apply the gospel and move forward in restoring internal conflict? And, and so really the title of today's message is how do we handle conflict in the church and how do we handle conflict in our lives? As gospel-driven people, we're going to handle conflict differently than anybody else because we're going to handle conflict not in a way that we're trying to win an argument, we're trying to win the debate, or we're just trying to win. We're going to handle our conflict in a way that honors Christ. We're, we're going to do it in a way that brings him glory. We're going to do that in our church family. We're going to do that in our own families. And so um, let me give you a bit of context here. So we're in Acts chapter 15, and we've been working through the book of Acts, looking at the church and pulling out these characteristics that, that turned the early church into a groundswell movement that changed the world because we want to be a groundswell movement in our neighborhoods and we want to change people's worlds in our neighborhoods. Amen? And so that's what we're about. So what do we have here? Context is Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas, this is before they had the fight, okay? 
before they got, they got mad at each other. Uh, they had just returned from their first missionary journey with some awesome stories. I mean, they had just come back from a mission trip, and they're guys, you ain't going to believe this. Gentiles are getting saved. Gentiles are coming to faith in Christ. This would be equivalent to you and I going to a, 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 a major Muslim country, and we come back, so you're not going to believe this, but it was like revival. Muslims were giving their life to Christ in the, in the hundreds. That's how it would be. I mean, the Gentiles coming to faith in Christ. Because remember, the early church primarily was Jewish in those early days. And so this is, one, opening up new kingdom expansion. Because remember, in the book of Acts, it's bookmarked. The first part of the book of Acts is grow my kingdom. The last part of the book of Acts, grow my kingdom. And the vehicle in the middle is the church. And so kingdom expansion now is taking place in Gentile regions. And as the momentum is building and Gentiles are responding to the good news announcement that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the dead to give life, that is abundant life, and that is eternal life. Just when it was going well, and the enemy threw a wrench into the system. Doesn't that sound familiar? When God is working, the enemy is always working. He's either working in a church, he's working in a marriage, he's working in a family, he's working in, an, in a life. And the enemy is, is always working because we need to understand we have a real enemy. And his purpose statement is to still kill and destroy. We can never forget that. He wants to take you down. He wants to hurt you. But Jesus, on the other hand, is for you. Jesus is for your joy. He is for you. And so just as the momentum is growing with the Gentiles, the enemy shows up and, well, he gets, throws a, a wrench into the system. And it's really an old controversy that has returned. And honestly, there's not many new heresies. It's just new her uh, old heresies recovered. You know, we're, we're dealing with heresies today in, in our local assembly that they have been dealing with for 2,000 years. And this is what happened now. And this old heresy is threatening to undermine the single most important doctrine, salvation by grace. Salvation by grace. This is what's so great about the gospel. The gospel is not religion. It's not you do some things and God will love you. No, it's God loves you. So he did some things and you just simply accept his gift. This is what's so cool about this. There's, there is nothing you can do to earn his salvation and make him love you more. On the flip side, there is nothing you can do to make him love you less or to push you further away from his salvation. His salvation is readily available to all those who will believe. This is why it's good news. This is why it's awesome. So here is the biblical premise of the message this morning. Conflict not properly handled can derail gospel work. So we're going to study the early church's response to contention as our standard today. So this is going to be our standard of how we handle conflict in the church, in marriages, in families, in our lives. All right, let's stand in honor of reading the Word of God. We're in 1 Corinthians 15, first 12 verses. It's entitled in my Bible, Dispute in Antioch. So dramatic. Some men came down from Judea and began to teach the brothers. All right, pick that up, the brothers. Unco uh, unless you are circumcised according to the custom prescribed by Moses, you cannot be saved. After Paul and Barnabas had engaged them in serious argument and debate, Paul and Barnabas and some others were appointed to go up to the apostles and elders in Jerusalem about this issue. When they had been sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and they brought great joy to all the brothers and sisters. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church, the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with him. But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders gathered to consider this matter, and there, after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, brothers, you are aware that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the gospel message and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now then, why are you testing God by putting a yoke on the disciples' necks that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we are saved through grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way they are. The whole assembly became silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul describe all the signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. So, Father, bless the reading of your word. 
Help us to understand what's happening in, in this passage. And then, Lord, help us to apply this principle, Lord. Help us to apply it when conflict happens in a Sunday school class or in a church body or in a marriage or a family or in relationships or at work. In Jesus' name, amen. So let me give you the backdrop of what's happening. And so we have this area of Antioch that has become increasingly important when it comes to kingdom growth. Let's just say, man, this is an area that God is moving. People are being saved. The church at Antioch is, is increasing on the regular. Uh, but understand, even so, Jerusalem was the center of all church authority. You could in some ways say that Jerusalem, the Jerusalem church, was the hub of, of the church in the early days. And so look at your notes here and write this down. I want us to understand this. Prior to the writing of the New Testament, the leaders in Jerusalem were the church's primary source of divine revelation and ultimate authority on orthodox teaching. So prior to having the New Testament, so in, in our day, we say, well, we disagree. Let's go to the Word of God. And we do this often. You know, something will come up, some, maybe a new, a new person comes to our church, and they have a different view on something. We say, well, awesome, man, we're not mad at you. We're, we're not here to fight you. Let's go to the Word. And, uh, and then we're going to come out with what the Word says. And so that's what, that's what we would do. But in their day, they couldn't do that. The New Testament had not been written at this early date. And so what would they do? They would go to uh, Jerusalem, to the apostles and the elders of the Jerusalem church, which was the, the first church. And they were the ones that really sat in, in power of what was, was orthodox teaching. And so as you can imagine, you can imagine if that's the case, if Jerusalem is the, the hub, if it's the primary church, you could call it the mother church, the mothership, for example. If that is the case, and it was the largest church at the time, well, a Christian coming from Jerusalem then would be looked at with great respect. So if I showed up in Antioch as a preacher and says, guys, by the way, I'm from, uh, I'm from Jerusalem, the Jerusalem church. Uh, James sent me. Automatically, my, my pedigree in their view was elevated. Because I'm from, I'm, from the, I'm from the mega church. I'm from the, the primary church. I'm from the seminary church. I'm from the mother church, right? Does that make sense? And so now they were elevated. So what they had to say then carried so much more weight than what the believer here in the, the Antioch church would be teaching. And so Gentile churches, particularly then, regarded anyone coming from headquarters as being the author, authoritative verse, uh, voice of God. So here's the contention. As we just read, some of these Jerusalem teachers, write it down, taught that anyone wanting to be saved must be circumcised. Did you see it in verse 1? Some men came down from Judea and began to teach the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom prescribed by Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, you can imagine, here is the problem. You now have what they consider the, the experts, you know, the, the ones who really know the Word of God, the ones coming from Jerusalem as the primary teachers and well, we're here to learn from you all, and now you're telling us there's a whole different way to be saved than what that Paul and Barnabas have been teaching? All of a sudden now, you just said, I'm not saved unless I'm circumcised. Could you imagine if I invited, uh, you know, one of the, the revered preachers of our world? I mean, you know, uh, I don't know if we could all agree on that guy, but let's just say it was like a Franklin Graham, right? He showed up. Maybe you don't like him. That's okay. We're using him fictitiously, okay? So don't get upset. It's all good. <laughs> Uh, but Franklin Graham shows up, and he's like the world preacher, just got done preaching in Poland this weekend. Man, the McClure's, our missionaries there, they got to go see him live. It was awesome. Uh, but anyhow, uh, so he's preaching, and he shows up, and he says, by the way, Fellowship Church, Pastor Chris has not always gotten it right, all right? He, he, he is right about Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection, but you all got to be circumcised to be saved. And so we're going to set up a surgery center next week. Now, that's going to upset some of you all right? And I hope, it, I hope it does. I hope it does. And so that's what happened here. It's like, how in the world? There, there's a, a whole other way to be saved. So the issue is running deeper than merely submitting to a surgical procedure, though. It's more than just, hey, uh, if to be saved, you got to submit to this procedure. You got to understand how, how one understands the place of circumcision in the church defined also how a person saw Israel and the Mosaic law in relationship to the new covenant. After all, God's covenants with Abraham, Israel, and David had defined the meaning of kingdom citizenship for generations. 
you would be outside of his kingdom if you did not have this mark. So circumcision identified a male as a true son of the covenant, an heir to the promise of God to all the descendants of Abraham. And it, it said you were a citizen of Israel. You are a citizen of heaven now. And so anyone not born Jewish, anyone not born uh, on, uh, on, uh, and then circumcised on the eighth day, they, they wanted to convert to be a true son of the covenant in, in, the, in these days. They had to learn Hebrew history. They had to learn it so well that they would be then put to a test about the Mosaic law. If they could pass the test, they would then be baptized by immersion, one of those public baptismal pools there, and then they would be circumcised, and now they'd be a full son of the covenant, and now a real citizen of God's kingdom. That's how it happened. So these Christians, to be honest with you, had some valid concerns. That's some valid concerns. If, if, if I'm a, a Jewish Christian, and I'm now in Antioch looking at Gentile Christians, I would wonder, well, how would these Gentiles appreciate the new covenant if they don't have some knowledge of the old covenant? Well, that makes a little bit of sense. I mean, you got to understand how bad it was, how bloody it was, how, how uh, man, rough it was to keep the law, and now you got grace. How would they understand how good grace is if they don't understand the Old Testament, right? So valid concern, valid concern. Or how could it be, how could it be so stinking easy to be a citizen of God's kingdom? I mean, really. How could it be this easy to become a child of God? That just doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem right. And then uh, I read this one. I thought this was kind of funny. There's got to be some sort of show of sincerity, Okay, I mean, you, if you're really a sincere believer, then you're going to be circumcised. I mean, I would say that's a good show of sincerity. Can I get an amen? <laughs> but these were valid concerns that, that these Jewish Christians had, but they were wrong. Valid concerns, but they were wrong. They didn't understand the new covenant. All right, write this down. Paul and Barnabas took serious issue with this teaching, as you can imagine. Any, any bit of heresy that popped up in the church... Man, the, the leadership should take quick and decisive action. Quick and decisive action. This is why we teach in our, our identity class, that, that first class someone takes before they join our church, we teach them the non-negotiable doctrines. Because if you're outside of our non-negotiables, it's going to be very hard for you to do life with us. You're always going to be frustrated. You're always going to be running up to a wall. You're always going to be opposed. And so what do we teach these non-negotiables? And so they had some valid questions. They did. But in the end, they contradicted the, the teaching of Jesus. And Peter and Barnabas knew this. They said, hey, valid, suppose, but they contradict what the Lord said. And the Lord is the preeminent one. The Lord is the boss. We go with him, right? Plus, this, this issue right here was answered a few chapters ago when Cornelius and his whole household got saved. Do you recall? Cornelius and his whole household were saved. Everyone in Jerusalem was satisfied that they were believers and that they received the Holy Spirit. Peter didn't require them to be circumcised. And so what we got to always remember here when it comes to sharing our faith, because we said we want to be a people who share our faith. It's why we put the mission on the wall, all those names on the wall back there. It's so awesome to hear stories of, of getting opportunity to share the gospel or some coming to faith. But we got to understand this truth right here and write it down. The gospel is Jesus Christ died on a cross and rose to the dead as a gift. It's a gift. You cannot earn it. There's nothing for you to do to, to gain it. It is a gift. It's given to you. He, we simply announce the good news that Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, died on the cross, rose to the dead, and whosoever will may believe. Okay, so here's the, that's a pretty big conflict. Would you agree? Pretty big deal. I mean, this, this is, can split some churches. I mean, I'm just saying. But how would they handle this serious sort of conflict? So here's how they did it. I love how they did this. This is how we got to handle things. The church leaders in Antioch, they appealed to their only source of divine authority, the apostles and the elders back in Jerusalem. What we would do today is we would appeal to the word of God. We'd say, hey, uh, okay, let, let's, look, let's look to the word together. Let's study this together. And so they formed a delegation, Paul and Barnabas, and then the circumcision teachers, those that were teaching 
this, this uh, circumcision. And they all went to the elders and the apostles, and they wanted to get a theological ruling. Okay? Now listen to this. There were no threats of excommunication. Paul didn't say, listen here, you heretic, you freak. If, if we get up there and you're wrong, you're out, baby. You're out. They didn't do that. The, the uh, circumcision teachers said, listen, Paul, you just wear us out. You think you're better than us because you came in different than us. And man, we just don't like how you preach. And here's the deal. If you're wrong, we never want to see your face again. They didn't do that. Kind of sounds like the modern church though, doesn't it? And so what they did, they just said, hey guys, listen, let's get this figured out. No violence, no threats. There was no backroom deals. Hey, you know, here's what we're going to do. It's Paul and Barnabas, they take half the people that believe that nonsense, and we'll take half the people that believe this nonsense. We're going to start our own churches. They didn't do any of that. They came together, unified around the person of Jesus Christ, and they said, what does truth say? And then they went with truth. You know, there's been times in my 23 years of pastoral ministry that, that I, uh, I didn't understand something quite right. And, you know, uh, to, to, to my hurt of my pride, it's best just to say, you know what, that, that's actually right. And then just correct yourself rather than to fight about it. So they went together to seek truth. All right, so write this down. The convening of the Jerusalem Council was an appeal to discover truth over this conflict. Maybe you've heard about it. Maybe you've read about it. Maybe you've heard someone preach or teach about the Jerusalem Council. This is it. They convened the Jerusalem Council, the apostles, the elders in Jerusalem. They brought them together, and they're going to discover what is truth around salvation. Is it by grace alone or by grace alone and circumcision? What is it? And this is the, this is the Jerusalem Council. Look at it in verse 3. Check this out. When they had been sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and they brought great joy to all the brothers and sisters. Now, I love this. <laughs> this, is why, this is what we got to get in our world. We never, we never, we never set back from our responsibility as a missionary. So they're on their way to the Jerusalem Council to do some important work. And while they're on their way, they're preaching and teaching and talking about how the Gentiles are getting saved. I mean, they're, they're just preaching the gospel. They're building up brothers and sisters. They're, they're going through meeting with the, the local assemblies. When they arrived at Jerusalem, verse 4, they were welcomed by the church, the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. And so again, Christians can't help but testify what God does. You know, when you gather in your Sunday school class here in a little bit, whether you go at 930 or you go at 11, one of the things you ought to be doing is talking about all that God is doing. If you're not talking about all that God is doing, Man, what, what, what are we doing here as believers? Yes, we study the Word of God. And yes, we, we fellowship. But talk about what God is doing. It's one of the ways we stay encouraged. And we say, man, God is really working in my life. He's working in my marriage. Man, God's working on my one. Man, it gives hope to the one who, it doesn't seem like God's working. And so, man, share your testimonies. Verse 5. But some of the believers who belong to the party, okay, listen to this. Believers, some people would say these are not believers, these Pharisees. But it says right here, believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, stood up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of Moses. So listen, you can be a believer and have messed up doctrine. You can be. It's called discipleship. Okay? And so someone doesn't have to agree to all the, the doctrine. They got salvation wrong. They were trying to add works to grace, and yet Luke says they're believers. All right, verse 6. The apostles and the elders gathered to consider the matter. Okay, so now the dispute is brought before the apostles and the elders. And now by now, what church history would tell us is many of the 12 apostles had already went on their own missionary journeys. They had all went out. They'd been sharing the gospel. Church history says that, that most of them left for various parts of the world to preach the gospel, and, and they died there. That's what church history says, but not all of them. Peter remained in Jerusalem. So he remained in Jerusalem to provide theological guidance. He was there to kind of, uh, I mean, to, to pastor and to care and to make sure the church was doctrinally pure and doctrinally right if it was going to be the one answering the questions for all of the, the churches that were coming online as the kingdom were expanding throughout the, the Roman Empire. And then John, obviously John had to stay because Jesus had given care of his mother to John, right? And so it would be pretty, pretty poor of John to say, well, Jesus... Uh, I'm out. Uh, I left your mom down at Jerusalem, you know, uh, city center nursing home, and uh, hope she's okay. And so most of the apostles were probably gone at this point. Peter and John, more than likely the only two apostles. 
And so the responsibility for functional leadership and instruction then was passed to a number of elders. And so we could read elders, pastor synonymously here. And so it was passed to, to uh, elders or pastors who the, who the church then would, would put their hands upon and say, hey, these are our leaders. And so functionally, the church would be led then by, by these pastors. One of them was James, the half-brother of Jesus. He was the actual pastor of the, the church at Jerusalem. He was the leader there. And so these were the ones that convened. You have Peter and John, more than likely. You got James, the Lord's half-brother, some of the other pastors, and then verse 7. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you are aware that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the gospel message and believe. So Paul, our Peter's referring back to, remember when, when God spoke to him and said, Hey, listen, these things aren't unclean. Remember that? Really cool, really cool account. He's saying right here, you know that, that God sent me to, be, uh, 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 to give the message to the Gentiles. And then he goes on and says, and God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He says, so you know that, and you know they got saved. Nine, he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. All right, so what Peter does is he stands up. And at this point, Peter, he's matured a lot. He's no longer quite as just jump jump to and speak he stands up and really very very uh, eloquently states this is the teaching and the matter of how god views it and you need to understand that we've discussed this very issue before and we settled it back in chapter 11 with the salvation of uncircumcised gentiles this is a case that has already been closed but this also shows great humility by the apostles and the elders the pastors of this church not only did they simply just say, hey, uh, you know, shut up and listen to what we said. We've already discussed that. We're not even going to listen to your case. No, they were humbled and said, well, bring, bring the case before us and let's look to the truth. Let's look to the word of God and, and let's see what we, what we know is true. And that is what humble leadership does. Humble leadership says, well, let's take a look at it. Let's reexamine the, the evidence and then, well, we'll come down with, with what the truth says. That not one time do they say, man, just, we, we dealt with this already. Did you not remember we dealt with this? Are you moronic? Take their ordination credentials. They no longer can speak for us. They didn't do any of that. They said, hey, well, bring it. Let's talk about it. After you've now given your evidence, Paul and Barnabas gave their evidence. Peter said, hey, by the way, this was already, already discussed. And we, we landed on this before, and your evidence does not persuade us. This is the truth of the word of God. I mean, what, what, what spiritually sensitive, wise men humbled themselves enough to, to reconsider? This is how we ought to be. When someone comes to us, someone comes to us with a, an offense, what's our first response in the flesh? What are you talking about? No, you were the run. You were the one. You did that. You said that. You see, we, we just go right into the flesh. We act out of pride. And so what happens then if people are going to apply the gospel of Jesus Christ to our lives and live this abundant life right here and right now, someone comes to us with an offense, we say, whoa, man, I'm, I'm, sorry that, I'm sorry that that's happened. Let's talk about that. Now, you may get down to it at the end and go, listen, you're, you have zero facts to back up what you said. And so therefore, you know, uh, there's really nothing for us to, uh, you know, to, to work on here. Or, hey, this is what we're going to believe. But you receive them humbly as, as Peter and John and the other pastors did. I think this whole scenario made such an impact on the Apostle Paul that he actually led his ministry like this. If you go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, he's speaking to his young protege, little Timothy, a young pastor, it's kind of near the end of Paul's life. And I think this really highlights how the Jerusalem council and the way Peter and John and the elders handled this situation in such a big way. It impacted him. We see him write about it here. It says, the Lord's servant must not quarrel, but must be gentle to everyone, able to teach and patient. And this is such a, a wonderful truth of scripture that we need to hold up now. And we need to make sure that our pastors, I need to make sure my heart is not quarrelsome. That, that I, I'm not given to, to arguments. Because sadly, too often in the modern church, I mean, pastors have given themselves to want to argue and be quarrelsome and not to listen to any other voices. It's their way or the highway. 
And that's not the way of the apostles. It's not the way of the, of the early church. And be patient, instructing his opponents with gentleness. Perhaps God will grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of truth. Then they may come to their senses and escape the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Now, you understand, Timothy was going through some issues in his church. And this is what Paul's writing to him about. saying, stay humble, stay teachable. Man, lean into them and perhaps God might, might give them repentance and they will escape the trap of the devil trying to destroy them. I mean, he modeled this in his ministry. This has got to be a model in our lives. It's got to be a model in our church. As we take conflict with humility. All right, so now near the end of the deliberations, you know, Peter took the floor. And, you know, he essentially just says, what does God say to the Gentiles? Let's go back to Acts chapter 10, verse 15. Acts chapter 10, verse 15. Again, a second time, the voice said to him, what God has made clean, do not call impure. Go to 11, verse 17. 11, verse 17. What does God say to the Gentiles? If then God gave them the same gift that he also gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, how could I possibly hinder God? I believe that's probably what Peter was saying to this group. Now, Luke does not record the line by line, point by point, of the, of the speech, but more than likely, it had to include these points. This is what God has already spoken to the Gentiles. So here's the verdict. There's the verdict. Write it down. The concept we know of as salvation by grace through faith. And so we believe that salvation is a gift. It is by grace, something great we don't deserve. And then when we give our lives to him, we're giving our lives to him to be our Lord. He, he is now our boss. We're surrendering our will to his will. He's now the boss. We do what he says, not what we want to do. And so I know it's easy in our world. We have this easy believism where someone, hey, I prayed a prayer and their life doesn't change a bit. Well, if that's you, I'd be very concerned about my salvation because if Christ is your savior, well, the Bible dictates he must be your Lord. And obviously that's going to look differently as you grow in discipleship. All right, look at verse 10. Now then, why are you testing God by putting a yoke on the disciples' necks that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to do? He's like, hey, listen, man, we couldn't even do that. This is why it's called the good news announcement. Verse 11. On the contrary, we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way they are. And the whole assembly became silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul describe all the signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. All right, so let's wrap this up here. Three lessons on dealing with conflict. Three lessons on dealing with conflict. Number one, conflict is inevitable. Expect it. Just expect it. Expect it in your friend groups. Expect it in your marriage. Expect it in churches. Conflict is inevitable amongst people. Issues that should have already been settled are going to resurface. People who should get along and love each other are going to knock heads every once in a while. Good-hearted, capable people are going to arrive at different, uh, completely different uh, conclusions on, on certain things. And when these things happen, understand, hey, listen, this is not a sign that your marriage is bad or your friendship is bad or your church is bad or your organization is bad. It just shows that you're normal. It just shows you're normal. That's what it shows. Now, your life shouldn't always be characterized by a conflict. If your life is always about conflict, there's something wrong in your life. You need to learn to apply the gospel. And because obviously if you are always experiencing conflict in every realm, it's probably you. And most of our issues, honestly, are gospel issues, aren't they? You know, we haven't crucified the flesh, and so we're selfish, we're prideful, whatever it may be. But it's inevitable, so expect it. Don't be shocked when it comes. Now, write it down. Harmony should be the rule, not the exception. So by and large, a a church, a marriage, a family, a friendship should be in harmony, but conflict will come. And how are you going to handle it? I hope we handle it as uh, gospel-centered individuals. And so if if you never see disagreements... If you never see disagreements when you interact with other people, then something has gone wrong. Communication has broken down, or, or people aren't being honest, or no one cares. People have checked out. And so what we do is we expect it to come on occasion, and then we handle it the Christian way. Humility 
and with gospel and with grace. Number two, conflict is hard, work the process. Conflict is hard, work the process. Conflict is always unpleasant, okay? I mean, it's always a bad deal. It's always going to be